Well, again, good to get together with you guys and worship and gather. There is power in gathering in his name and, and just the power and the presence of God. And thanks for hooking up your faith with ours as we just pray and intercede and just continue to lift up this great state of Wisconsin. And we're just believing God is going to do some amazing things and we're going to see some turnarounds that are going to be attributed to what God has done and by the power of his spirit. You know, the scripture says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And it's easy to, to want to, to, you know, go after the flesh and blood and things like that. It's human nature. And, um, but God calls us to a higher calling, to, to swing a sword of the spirit, to take our authority in the name of Jesus. And, and that's really what we've, we're doing this morning. We're just standing in the gap, interceding, for this state with the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but they are powerful through God. We have faith in those weapons, and so continue to stand in faith for this, this state and uh, just for, for God's protection, provision, and just for the gospel to go forth in Wisconsin. Ultimately, that's, that's why we're here. Praise God. Well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to open it with a passage of Scripture, and this is found in Ephesians chapter 6. It's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, and the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So here we see very clearly kind of what we were just talking about this morning. You know, there can be a temptation. You know, back then, the temptation was to to want to go after Rome. You know, Rome that had, had been oppressing um, from Israel's standpoint, who had been, who had been oppressing um, the Jewish nation. And there was such a frustration, even at, before Jesus ascended, the apostle Peter said, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, they're thinking natural, militaristic, flesh and blood, weapons, things like that. And Jesus is starting to get them to change the way they think. You know, you do have weapons. There is a warfare going on. But it's not a flesh and blood warfare. It's not physical, natural, carnal weapons. You're fighting against things you can't see with your eyes. And yet you've got the weapons that you need to fight those things. So he's saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And as we understand this battle, we go through this battle, we have battle stories, we probably have some battle scars. We have different things as we're fighting this good fight of faith down here. But the thing that I really want to focus on, this whole idea, this concept of spiritual warfare, is the very first thing that he says to set it off. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The simple fact that he admonishes us to be strong in the Lord very clearly implies that it's possible to not be strong in the Lord. All right? Your theology doesn't change. Whether I'm weak in the Lord or whether I'm strong in the Lord, my theology stays the same. But there's something that changes that causes me to be strong in the Lord. So before he even delves into the whole weaponry and battles, and he says, be strong in the Lord. First things first, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Um, I want to take a look at one more scripture, and I'm going to pull these two scriptures together in a, in a certain concept, and hopefully you'll be able to clearly see where we're, coming from this morning. Jesus, parting words to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he said, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, because I've, I've been given authority in heaven and earth, therefore you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. There's a couple ideas I just want, I want to pull together here. First of all, the idea that we're going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What's going to make us strong in the Lord? 
What's the determining factor whether I'm strong in the Lord or weak in the Lord? Jesus really lets us know here. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just a little background on that word disciple. Uh, first of all, it's mentioned 257 times in the New Testament. So we got to do something with this word. You can't gloss over it 257 times, right? It's got to somehow reconcile with the rest of our theology here. So the word disciple comes from the Latin word, dis I'm probably going to butch butcher some of this stuff up, but um, discipulus, meaning student. The word discipline is from a Latin word dis disciplina, meaning instruction and training. It's derived from the root word disir, to learn. So what is discipline? Discipline is to study, learn, train, and apply a system of standards. Okay? Jesus said, go and make disciples. And he goes on to be very clear, even in verse 20, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. So a disciple isn't just somebody who believes, but it's somebody who's obeying commands, okay? A disciple is somebody who's doing something that their Lord told them to do. At one point in Jesus' ministry, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do what I say? Lord isn't just some flashy thing that you throw around there. Lord means something. Lord means that I'm your supreme authority and I'm telling you to do stuff and you do it. That's when I'm Lord of your life. I'm not Lord in name only. I'm Lord because you do what I tell you to do. Teach them to obey. There is a great revelation. There's a great truth here. And the title of the message this morning is simply Getting Strong in the Lord. Getting Strong in the Lord. We've been talking the last few weeks about kind of what I've almost said was an accidental series called The Light Yoke Defined. And we talked about how his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's the way he is. He'll just say, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. The essence of that yoke is to rejoice, to pray, to give thanks, and let his peace rule. That's the essence of the light yoke. That's what I'm called to do. And that yoke doesn't change. It's a light, beautiful yoke. And yet, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, we learn what Jesus is saying here is to make disciples, make disciplined learners. Let me put it this way. There is a strong connection between your being strong in the Lord and being a disciplined learner, doing what he tells you to do. This is so important. And again, how does that reconcile with grace? I'm saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, it's not of myself. We get these theological concepts and if we're not careful, we can kind of cause confusion in our head. What I want to do this morning is I want to encourage you in a way that I'm believing God you're going to see all these, all these concepts put together and you're going to see how they don't, they don't conflict with each other at all. They're in perfect harmony with each other. Have you noticed that when you read the Bible sometimes, you're reading along, it's like, whoa, the, the Bible's strong grace. Nothing that I can do can separate me from the love of God. Wow, I mean, just it's strong grace. And then you're reading along in another place and it's like, wow, strong consecration, you know? This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Whoa, where did that come from? Thought I was saved by grace through faith. You know, and so you can kind of get these ideas in your head. What is, what is it? Is it consecration? Is it grace? Is it, and so we can kind of get these ideas jumbled up. And I really wanted to deal with this one now because we've just come through this, really the series of the light yoke defined so you can see how it all fits and flows together. Understand how... Being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might many times is going to just come down to simply doing what you already know to do. There is going to be a discipline. There is going to be a discipline that is a key part of your freedom. All right? A discipline in spiritual things. So let's go ahead and 
delve into it. I think you'll, you'll see it more as we, as we look at a little bit more. So getting strong in the Lord. I can be strong in the Lord. I can be weak in the Lord. But at some point, there's going to be discipline. There's going to be a discipline that causes me to get strong. I remember when I was a um, kid, that movie Rocky came out in 76, was it, or something like that. We were, I was pretty little. I was Abby's age, actually. I was about 10 years old. Me and my brother went to it. And if you saw the movie, you kind of know there's that, um, that theme, that musical theme, getting strong now. And you'll see Rocky doing his push-ups and his running and all that kind of stuff. And I remember being so inspired by that movie and the music is so compelling. And it was just amazing how there was something in that movie that inspires discipline. It just inspires you to do what you already know to do. And that's what I want this message to be to you this morning. A lot of times we'll come to church and we'll think, I want to hear something new. I want to hear something fresh. I want this, like, I've got this missing link. I know there's a breakthrough here, and if I can just hear that missing link, it's just going to make everything make sense, and I'm going to be free, and sometimes we can learn, we're, we're wanting to learn and learn and learn to figure out that thing. The message of discipline is this. You've got answers. You've got the stuff in your toolbox. You've got the things that you've learned already in you. And there's just a discipline to do what you already know is true that's going to make you free, that's going to cause you to be strong in the Lord. The first area of being strong in the Lord, and I'm kind of referring to these just two areas this morning in terms of disciplines. The first area is the discipline of grace. Grace is a discipline. Ephesians 2 8 through 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We know that's true. We amen that's true. 2 Timothy 2, 1 says this way, puts it this way. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Passion says, Timothy, my dear son, live your life empowered by God's free-flowing grace, which is your true strength found in the anointing of Jesus and your union with him. You're saved by grace through faith. I'm saved by grace through faith. I gotta change the way, I, I gotta realize I am saved by grace through faith. Not, again, just theologically. I gotta start here. I am loved by God. It takes discipline. You got to renew your mind after you miss it. You're saved by grace through faith the same way you were before you missed it. In your bad days, you're still saved by grace through faith. When people are mean to you, you're still saved by grace through faith. There's a discipline of your identity that you have. I am saved by, there's a discipline where I'm coming back to those truths. Hebrews says it this way. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines. It's good for the heart to be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have occupied, who've been occupied with them. Um, I think this is a passion. It says, don't let anyone lead you astray with all sorts of novel and exotic teachings. It is more beautiful to feast on grace and be inwardly strengthened than to be obsessed with dietary rules which in themselves have no lasting benefit. So what are, what are we saying here? There is a discipline of grace. Dis if you can think of it like this, think of dis the discipline of grace as a doorway. I'm walking through a doorway of grace. It's the gift of God. That discipline of grace is disciplining myself to acknowledge those truths that God has done in me through Jesus Christ. There's a discipline to realize that no matter how much the world is changing, those truths are the same and they don't change me. No matter what anybody, I like to say this to me, no matter what anybody has done to me, it can't undo what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago. That doorway of grace changed me. We see here in... Um, not only, did I, not only was I forgiven, but 2 Corinthians says, there from, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any person is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has 
come. When I walked through this doorway of grace, there was just a bunch of stuff that God did in me. All I did to walk through that doorway of grace was call upon the name of the Lord. I knew I was a sinner in need of a savior. I wasn't trying to solve all the world's problems as a means to an end of my salvation. I just looked up and said, I know one thing's for sure. No matter what standard I set up, I couldn't even keep my own standard. I'm a sinner. I have a problem. I have guilt. I have shame. I need a savior, Jesus. That's when the cross makes sense. And I believed on Jesus and I walked through that doorway of grace and he did all this stuff in me. He forgave me. He made me a new creation. And he's telling me to let my heart be established in what he's done in me. I'm a new creation. He put the Holy Spirit in me. He gave me his righteousness. He shed his love abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. He just did everything in me. And it was all a gift. I did nothing to get it. And yet, even though all those things are beautiful and they're true and we're wonderful and we're inspired by them, it's not just on a Sunday morning that it takes to be strong in the Lord. There's a discipline of grace that in all those contexts of life, when I feel a certain way, when people have treated me a certain way, this is still true. That's why Paul sums it up so beautifully. It, no, their height, nor death, peril, calamity. Is there anything that can separate us from the love of, God, love of God? Is there any context of life we can go through that changes all this stuff? And we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind as we're believing the love of God over and over in the face of our failure. Yes, God tells me to forgive 70 times seven. I know he's good here. I know he's gonna take and restore and there's mercy and grace to help in time of need. Here's another, that other scripture that kind of goes hand in hand with that. It says, and this is again, part of a discipline of grace. When you're disciplined in grace, the scripture says, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a discipline of grace. If I'm believing, if I'm disciplined in grace, I'm gonna come boldly before that throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If I'm not disciplined in grace, I believe it. I'd get it right on a theology, but I'm not really disciplined. I'm not strong in the Lord. I'm not allowing that grace to identify me, who I am. Then I'm not going to come boldly before the throne of grace. I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget who I am. That being strong and disciplined in grace is what keeps your identity in Christ. There's a fight for your identity. Satan is after your identity and who you are and what you have. That discipline of grace is when you hold on to your identity. Yes, I'm going through life, but it doesn't change the fact that I still am a new creation. His Holy Spirit does still live in me. And, you know, I, this is who I am. Praise God. And so there is a discipline, we just simply call it a fight for that identity, a discipline of grace where I'm holding on to who I am. That's, that's a fight of faith. All right, there's a discipline there. It's not just enough to know it and then just do whatever you want. You gotta know it and live it so you can st stay in the moment of who you are and overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. So there's this identity of grace and I, I kinda want to do that, that backdrop but this is where I'm really going. Here's, here's the uh, kind of the, the means to an end. That grace not only defines us and lets us know who we are. When we walk through that doorway of grace, I've called upon the name of the Lord. I believe I'm born again. I'm a new creation. He puts his Holy Spirit in me. He makes me righteous, sheds his love abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. That's all the things that happen as a result of the new birth. And there's a discipline of holding on to that, not losing sight of who I am and what I have. The discipline of grace in terms of being strong in the Lord retains who I am and what I have. But that discipline of grace and in, in the grace of God doesn't just stop there. It reminding me who I am and what I have. The grace of God has another teaching ministry. And it's this. For the grace of God that brings salvation, that got us through that doorway into the grace, teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. I don't know what's tripping you up. I know what trips me up, but I know one thing about whatever it is that trips you up or trips me up. He's redeemed us from every lawless deed. 
deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Wow. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and word lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That means now. That doesn't mean in heaven. That means now. We, we have been redeemed from every lawless deed now. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. I pass through this door of grace. I pass through this door of grace, and there's a discipline of that grace. I remember I'm loved by God. I remember I'm a new creation. I remember what God has done in me. But that same grace is teaching me something. Ultimately, what that, that grace is teaching me, the grace is teaching me there's another door. There's another door. There's not, it's not just about one door. It's not just about a single door of grace that I'm walking through that I'm getting disciplined in. The grace of God is teaching me that I have the ability to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly and righteously in this present age. The grace of God is saying there's a door number two. You've walked through door number one, but I'm leading you and guiding you through another door. And that door is the door of the Spirit. And there's a discipline, not only of grace in your life, but there's a discipline of the Spirit that grace points you to. That the grace of God teaches you it's there. And this is a big part of being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You're going to be disciplined in what grace has provided for you, what grace has done in you. But when grace points you to the door of the Spirit, then it's the power of God, not just to know who you are, but to be who you are. Not to just have that cool stuff. I'm not just down here to brag on my specs. Hey, I'm a new creation. Hey, I got the power of God through whom God can do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think. Hey, I got the love of God. Jennifer. Hey, well, that's good. You got to start here. This is the work that he does in you when you walk that door of grace. But he says, hey, that same grace teaches you there's another door. There's a door of the Spirit. You got to walk through this door. This is a door that represents what God did in you. This is a door that represents what you're going to do as you live for God. Only God could do what he did when you pass through this door. Only you can do what God calls you to do when you pass through this door. God isn't going to do this for you. You're going to need both of these to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Because when you pass through this door, that second door, it's what we're calling the discipline of the spirit, the door of the spirit, which is really the other piece of this. Galatians 5 says, This then I say, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's great that the, Holy, that the grace says, hey, you can live above ungodliness and worldly lusts in this present age. How do I do that? Walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the ungodly lusts and desires of this present age. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you don't do the things that you wish. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In other words, I'm walking in something and there's a fruit of the Spirit that's being born in me right here. Something's changing in me. As I walk in the Spirit, I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a doorway of the Spirit that gives me victory over the flesh. We're going to get into some specifics in a little bit. I just want to go high level here to understand this doorway exists. It's possible when Jesus redeemed me from every lawless deed, it's possible to walk in the Spirit in a way that I don't fulfill one of them. But i got to go through this door. It's a doorway of the Spirit. This is what's going to cause me to walk in. This is, what's, this is what causes you to turn on that cool thing you got when you got through the doorway of grace. We were talking with, with Elliot the other day. He got a new computer. We are talking about all the specs and the cool things that it can do. And it's great. And you get that and you get it home. you got to turn it on though if you're going to really enjoy it. It doesn't do you any good to sit it and keep it in the box and talk about what it can do. And that's kind of what we can do when we fall. Just stop at door number one. That same grace that did all that stuff in you in door number one is saying, hey, I'm teaching you something. There's another door. I, Grace, am teaching you to walk through that second door. And, 
as you walk through that door, again, this is kind of saying a similar thing. Galatians 6, he says, don't be deceived, God isn't mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He's talking to Christians here. But those who sow to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we don't lose heart. There's process here of walking in the spirit. Uh, the living says, if you plant good seeds of spirit life, you will reap the beautiful fruits that grow from everlasting, from the everlasting life of the spirit. That's what we were talking about. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. There is an intentionality of sowing to the spirit, of walking to the spirit. What does that mean? We'll get into what that means, but I just want to get the concept across right now. There is something that I'm going to do as I'm walking through that door. I'm going to be intentional about sowing and walking because as I'm doing that, it's producing something. I thought it was all done there when I walked through grace. Well, there's, that's what, what God did in you. But again, there's nothing. It's coming. You'll notice that. He, I love how he, he words this. You will, uh, if you plant good seeds of the spirit life, you reap beautiful fruits that grow from the everlasting life of the spirit. You have the Holy Ghost in you, but you're reaping of the Holy Ghost that's in you when you walk in the spirit. What are you doing? You're turning it on. The apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, stir up the gift that is in you through the laying out of my hands. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Over here, you got a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind through grace. But you got to stir it up and turn on and stir up the spirit of God for power, love, and a sound mind to be active in your life. This is where you get strong in the Lord. I'm not getting a new revelation. I'm doing what I already know. I've been disciplined by grace. I found out who I am. I found out what I have. Now I'm going to pass through the second door where grace is pointing me and I'm going to walk in the spirit. I'm going to turn this thing on. I'm going to see what this thing can do. This is where I'm by faith doing something. All right? I'm not earning anything here. I don't get forgiveness by this. I'm not, you know, there's no favor I'm trying to get from God. I'm not trying to pay for sin over here. There's no legalistic. When you say the word legalism, it has a very specific meaning, all right? Legalism is a human effort to attain favor and right standing with God, all right? I'm not doing what I'm doing over here to attain right standing with God. In fact, the only reason I'm over here is because I've already attained right standing with God through coming through that door of grace. It's the, it's the right standing with God. It's my God-given righteousness that gives me the ability to walk in the Spirit, and the efforts and the obeying of my Lord over here is not an attempt to do what God accomplished here. I had to pass through this door to get there. Right over here is my, what did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What motivates me to walk in the spirit? I love Jesus. It's my love for God that's my motivation here. I'm obeying him. And the only reason I can walk through this door of loving him is because I first walked through this door of him loving me. I love him because he first loved me. My love for him is not undermining his love for me in any way. Thank you, Lord. I can walk in the spirit because you love me. And I can wage warfare with your weapons. And when I'm swinging that sword of the spirit, I'm not trying to accomplish anything of righteousness. I'm swinging that sword because you've put it in my hand and you've given it to me to, be down, to do business down here that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's why I walked through that door. I love God. It's my love for him. And that's what he did. You know, Jesus, when we walked through that door, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He offered him up a, a sacrifice for us. When I'm walking through this door, door over here, I'm offering myself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's where I'm laying down my life. It in no way undermines grace. It in no way undermines the effort that I take the effort that I'm diligent to do down here. It's a door that God has ordained me to walk through. And there's power here and there's strength here. You know, when we look at, um, um, go back, I guess, to that Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of yourself, lest anyone should boast. But then it goes on to say, for you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works he's ordained you to walk in. Over here, you find out I'm disciplined in grace. Hey, I'm not worthless. I'm not meaningless. I'm his workmanship. I'm created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yeah, I'm disciplined in that. I'm disciplined in that identity. He's ordained you for those good works 
to walk in. For you to walk in. Grace lets you know you're his workmanship. Grace lets you know you got good works. He's ordained you to walk in. But you got to go through door number two to actually walk in them. It's over here you're going to walk in the good grace works you found out about in grace. But here you're going to walk in something. And you're going to find, in fact, when you look at, um, I think, it's, yeah, Timothy here, he says, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, others are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are made for special occasions, the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourselves pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Run away from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living. Look at that. This is the New Testament. Pursue righteous living. Is that compatible with grace? Yeah, it is. Door number two. Pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, peace. Enjoy the companionship of all those who call upon the Lord out of pure hearts. What is he doing? He's saying, if you keep yourself pure, you're going to be ready for the master and useful for every good work. What good work? The good works he's ordained you to walk in. Over here, you find out that he's got good works for you to walk in. But when you walk through the power of the Spirit that the grace of God tells you is there, that you can put aside God, godless, you know, ungodliness and worldly lust, and you can walk through that, and it has that purifying effect, he says he makes you ready for those good works. This door is, because you can be here, and a lot of times I've been here, you're here, and you're frustrated, and you know there's stuff, and God's calling you to do some stuff. What he's calling you to do is really to prepare you for what he wants you to do, do. The good works he's ordained you to walk in. But we've got to see that. We can't be confused that just because there's effort here, that it's some way undermining grace. It isn't. It's by design. In fact, when we saw that, we read that one scripture. He said, you know, don't be weary in well-doing. You will reap in due season if you faint not. That's describing effort. That's describing a walk in the Spirit. You know what it's really describing? It's describing faith, ultimately. You're walking by the Spirit by faith. You're doing what God has told you to do by faith. And faith is not some inspirational feeling to do what you know you should do. Faith is doing what you know you should do because you know it's right even when you don't have inspiration. That's faith. And you learn that over here. Because when you're walking in the Spirit, God says this, but my flesh is pulling. There's that conflict. It doesn't matter. I don't feel inspired. But I'm walking by faith. He's my Lord and I'm doing what he says. That's faith. I don't have to be inspired to do the right thing. I just have to know God has said it. That's good enough. I can do the right thing on that basis. So it doesn't have to be the word plus a gooey feeling. I can just see it in the word. The same word that he wrote, the, the spirit that's in me will bear witness that that word is true. This is the cool thing about the spirit life too. You know, a lot of times people say, how can you know you're a child of God? How can you know you're going to go to heaven when you die? Well, when you, we've all passed through that door, one of the things the Holy Spirit does is he bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And there's an intuitive knowing that you're a child of God. There's an intuitive peace that passes your understanding that you're his. All right? The same Holy Spirit over here that bears witness that you're a child of God over here will bear witness that um, the Bible is the word of God. How can you know that Jesus is the way? I know. How can you really know this Bible is the word of God? Same witness. The spirit who's in me is the one who wrote it. Every word inspired by the spirit of God. Holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the other things he does over here is you learn the authority and the integrity of the word of God. As long as it's just spiritual concept and so-and-so thinks this and so-and-so thinks that, you got to walk through that door of the spirit. One of the great things you get when you walk through that door of the spirit is your own personal witness that this Bible is the word of God and you begin to walk in it. That's where things begin to, things begin to change. That's where there's, there gets to be some, well, to say there's some traction spiritually. Um, when I'm walking in the Spirit, I not only not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, but Jesus said, 
when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. This is where I not only get prepared for those good works to walk in, but this is where I find out what those good works are. It's the spirit walk, walking through that spirit door. I'm living for you, Father God. Here's where I'm learning. He's showing me things to come. He's showing me what that work is. Sometimes there's a feeling out process. We looked at a few weeks back where the Apostle Paul thought, man, I'm going to go to Bithynia. No, not Bithynia. I'm Asia Minor. Not Asia Minor. Oh, Macedonia. Okay, that's it. There's a feeling out, but he got that by the Spirit because the Spirit forbade him to go to Bithynia. The Spirit forbade him to go to Asia Minor. Then, then they got the witness of the Spirit to go to Macedonia. You can see over here, because he's walking in the Spirit, he's getting Spirit direction. There's a Spirit purification that happens here in putting to death the deeds of the body and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, but there's spirit direction that happens over here that I get through walking through door number two. That doesn't happen here. I can stand here and pontificate the glories of what God has done in me, but I gotta walk in the spirit to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I gotta walk in the spirit to have ears to hear what the spirit is saying. I've gotta be intentional about getting spiritually minded so I can get things. There's a part I play. These are not contrary truths. They're complementary truths. This is what children of God do. They walk in the spirit. And it's not, it doesn't make the yoke light. The yoke, or it doesn't make the yoke heavy. The yoke is still light. The yoke is light because you're carrying it by faith. The spirit is, where the spirit of the Lord is, it doesn't say there's heaviness. It says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's liberty. When you're walking in the spirit, it's a liberty walk. It's a freedom walk, all right? In fact, um, he's going to show you, he's going to guide you. Um, so as we're talking about getting strong here and walking in the Spirit, the essence of walking in the Spirit is this, and it's really captured in Colossians 3, 1. Since then you've been raised a new life with Christ. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you died to this life, your real life is hidden with God in Christ. When Christ who is our life is revealed, the whole world, revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Walking in the spirit is basically, in essence, it's spiritual mindedness. And this is where, when you think about, um, um, when we're talking about being strong in the Lord. You gotta be strong in identity. Don't let go of who you are. Don't forget what you have. Hold on to those things. Let God's inward work by the new creation and new birth define who you really are. But then turn this thing on and walk in the spirit because this, this is spirit empowered. And I'm going to come on over here and I'm going to walk in the spirit. I'm going to walk in. Now, what does this mean? We're going to said we're going to get a little vague, but I want to get a little more specific here. What do I mean by walking through that door? What do I mean by walking in the spirit? Setting your mind on things above. This is where being strong spiritually has some compelling similarities to being strong physically, right? If you are weak physically and you want to get strong physically, then you are going to, you're going to have to set your body on that bike. You're going to have to set your body on the treadmill or set that body on a run. You're going to have to set it on, you know, a good walk. You're going to have to set it on something. You know, and as you set your body on that thing, again, no inspiration necessary, required. And if you've, you know, if you've been through the, these things, you know, I can tell the difference. You know, when I'm disciplined, I can make any diet look good. When I'm disciplined to work out, I can make any diet plan look good, pretty much. You know, when you're really disciplined to do something, you're setting your body on something. You're, you're forcing your body to have to do this there's no inspiration. And you're doing it by faith and you know that you're going to reap in due season if you faint not, right? There is a setting our body on things that can turn a weak body into a strong body because we're setting our body on something. Set your mind on things above where Christ is. How do I go from that, that condition of weak spiritually to strong spiritually? That same discipline discipline, where discipline is not a bad word that undermines the work of grace. Discipline is a good work, the good word that works with a walk in the spirit and causes me to grow and put to death the deeds of the body. Discipline is the thing that keeps me spirit steady and keeps my mind on things above. 
Now, when we think about working out in the natural, you have a regimen if you're going to do something. If you want to go from weak physical to strong physical, you got a regimen. You got your deal. It could have diet, exercise, how many times a week do you do certain things and all that. And that's going to be different for everybody. Same is true spiritually. When you begin to purpose, you realize who you are and you're walking through the door and say, Lord, I'm going to walk in the spirit. There is going to be a regimen, all right, that the Holy Ghost gives you. I'm not up here this morning to tell you the regimen, all right, any more than I would tell you the diet plan that works for everybody. There is going to be a spirit-ledness in your regimen as well, too. You'll notice, and I, I kind of joke, even as I'd, I'd come back or, you know, I'd want to get in shape and I'd see a movie that really inspires me or something like that, I'd think, yeah, I'm going to get on that treadmill and I think I'm going to tear it up and, wow, this is, man, I can run faster than what I thought I could and this is great and I'm going to, you know, and about, you know, 49 seconds later, it's like, oh, man, I had these great aspirations, but I'm just not in shape. You know, my cardiovascular is that big and I'm trying to tear it up, you know? And that's where, you know, be, be patient. You know, you'll reap in due season. You'll, you'll develop that in due season. And it's the same way true spiritually. You can think, yes, that's it. I got a, I'm getting strong now spiritually. And I'm going to read five chapters a day. And yet your spiritual attention span is about that big. Because you've just, your, your mind is just full of stuff. And this is where we can just feel overwhelmed. And, oh, I just can't get it. I'm, just, oh, I'm, just, I'm one of those. Anybody can develop their spiritual attention span. Anybody can get strong in the Lord. In the same way in a natural physical setting, yeah, does it take some discipline? Yeah, it does take some discipline. Does it take some discipline in some spiritual things? Do, you know, in the natural, do you always feel like going on that run? Do you always feel like eating the healthy food? Do you always feel like that? No, but you know that, you know, you will reap in due season if you faint not and get off the wagon, Right? And so you stay on the wagon and you do the right things knowing that you're going to reap in due season. Spiritual things are set up the same way. So to the spirit and you will love the spirit reap. And you're sowing by faith. You're sowing by faith knowing that there's a reaping that you're getting of the spirit of God. And this is why a preacher can't stand up and preach the regimen. All right. This is the regimen is going to be, Lord, show me the regimen. Show me where do I start here? You know, and it's an amazing thing how God a lot of times will have you just start out meditating on little stuff. You can take one verse and just think about it. I mean, a lot of times when I come back to getting, okay, God, I'm going to get serious about walking in the spirit. I'm going through that door. I, you know, I try to, I, when I don't go through that door and I try to just stay here, just stay here, live here. Forget that. The grace of God saying, uh, Ed, I'm teaching you, uh, deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Be who you are. Don't just, again, pontificate and brag on your specs. It's time to turn this thing back on and tear it up for the kingdom of God. You know, go back there to the spirit of God. It's not that I leave it or forsake it. I'm doing this, but I'm doing this in, and I'm still doing this in the broader context of grace. It's not like I go away from grace to the spirit. The broader context is always grace. All right, so I'm doing this from the perspective of grace. And you got to get these in the right order. If you try to walk through this door without walking through that door, you're back to legalism, definitely. You got to walk through this door from that door. Can we slip into that as human beings? Yeah, we can. Can we be used by God and kind of get a little proud and think and start to run a little math and feel like we're really something over here? Human beings, yeah, we can. Can we slip into that? We got to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. All right, so even as I'm over here, I don't lose sight of the fact that everything that I'm doing in walking in the Spirit is in that broader context of grace. That first door is a huge door that overshadows everything that I do for him. I love him here because he first loved me there. And I never lose sight of that. This is where we have to, this is where, this is where it's so valuable. The light yoke, I'm rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. What does that do? It keeps that context of grace in place. When I'm rejoicing, I'm living in that place of rejoicing. I don't forget about door number one. I don't become that un unforgiving servant and, you know, strangle my brother, but I'm remembering, no, he loved me. He gave himself for me. So these doors, they're not, they're not this door doesn't undermine, undermine that door. It's the, it's the continuation of the work of grace where I'm coming through here and I'm doing what God has called me to do. 
It can just be a, and this is where, this is what I would say to kind of help you um, get a regimen to, to start walking. Listen to your own heart at things that really bless you. Are there certain songs that bless you? Are there certain books? Are there certain maybe movies or things like that that you watch? All these different things are different ways you set your mind on things above. Reading the Bible is one way, not the only way you set your mind on things above. Prayer, rejoicing, fellowship, these are all different ways you're setting your mind on things above. It doesn't say in Colossians 1, read your Bible and pray. It just says set your mind on things above. So this walk in the Spirit, again, regiment-wise, it's got to be very personal. It's got to be very custom to what, what blesses you. And I've found a lot of times this. If there's something that really blesses you, hang out there for a while. If there's a song that really blesses you, it's like, wow, maybe that song, I mean, I remember just recently the Goodness of God song. It would just kind of bring me to a place of gratitude and appreciation. It's like, wow. It's like, oh, the song's over. And Lord's like, you know, Ed, you could play that song again if you want to. <laughs> you don't just have to be there for four minutes and eight seconds. You can play it again, you know. It's okay. I'm not going to throw a flag. Because a lot of times through repetition, you're gleaning more, and, or maybe it's that verse, or maybe it's a movie that just it put, gets you in that place. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. The Lord makes this desirable, where I'm going after things. And then you're there and that leads to something else. It reminds you of the scripture, which reminds you of that book, which reminds you of a testimony. I'll tell you what, when I'm over here and I'm walking in the spirit, there's just nothing like this. There's, what are you doing? I'm being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm walking in the spirit. Do I know everything? No. But I'm, str I'm walking with God. His spirit's real to me. Over here, I, I, my confession is, and I know spiritual things are real. Not just because they're technically theologically real, but I'm experiencing. When you walk through door number two as a child of God, you experience the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. You experience a power that's beyond yourself. Creating in you a distaste and a disdain for something that's owned you for years. All of a sudden you see through it. All of a sudden it rings hollow over here. Because you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's discipline over here and it's okay. There's discipline over here to get back up and live for God. Yeah, if there's a throne of grace, we can come, boldly receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Thank you, Lord. Again, I walk through this door and I find out who I am and what I have. In this door, I am being who I am and I am using what God has given me. And there is discipline in that. Don't be afraid of that word discipline. And don't be afraid when God begins to move in your heart and challenge you with things. I know over here that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, I should live soberly and righteously. And a lot of times we can get caught over here and brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so and finger wagging and backbiting and all that. And it's like, I'm not, you know, I'm just like, we can get frozen. Forget all that junk and just say, you know what, Lord? You show me. What, what do you want me to do? Because if God's leading you to do some things, if God is letting you to lay aside some weights and sins that so easily beset you to help you walk through that door and, the, and run this race with endurance and patiently, he's preparing you for good works he's ordained you to walk in. And that was a cool thing about the, you know, the Rocky movie. You know, it wasn't just the working out and the music. You can see, you, you can see victory. You can see glory. You can see what you're going for. You're going to fulfill the good works he's ordained me to walk in. Why am I walking in the Spirit? There's good things He wants me to do. I have purpose in those good works. I'm not just getting free for the sake of getting free. I'm getting free to do what He's called me to do. I'm getting free. I see a bigger picture here. But grace, the grace of God to get free that comes by the power of the Spirit of God. This is where He's going to talk to you. This is where you can write your regimen. I don't care if it's just one scripture a day. And say, I'm going to read that scripture and I'm going to go, He'll build on it in a way that his yoke will stay easy and his burden is light. We make our burdens light. We're the ones who say, I'm going to read 10 chapters a day. I'm going to get through the Bible in six months. And he doesn't do that to us. We do that to ourselves. This is where we need to be listening and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is your burden? What is that thing? What is the thing? It, it doesn't say the burden doesn't exist. 
it's light. It means that there's something there you're going to do. There's something that he's called you to do. And it's light and he's, he'll give you the grace to do what he tells you to do. Have you noticed that? You can kind of do what people have run the spiritual math and try that and try that and try that. And then you get something in your heart to do. And there's grace on that. And that's anointed. And when you begin to walk in the spirit, you get that stuff. You, you, you get in fellowship. Because one of the cool things that you got over here, one of the cool things that are part of your specs, is the anointing that abides within. And you need not, need not that any man teach you. You know all things because he's there. Because the spirit, the anointing is there. You find out your specs here. You got to walk in the spirit though. As you begin to walk in the spirit, you begin to fellowship and get familiar with that anointing that you found out abides in you. And that's when you, you begin to see things to do and you hear things to say. And that's when this relationship with Jesus becomes alive. And there's no comparing yourselves amongst yourselves. Hey, how many scriptures do you read per day? How many worship songs do you listen to per day? How much? There's none of that. The Bible says if you do that, you're not wise. Because you're not my Lord. I'm not your Lord. I say this all the time. I'm your pastor, not your master. I'm just here to help you facilitate your relationship with God. That's my purpose for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we're not tossed to and fro like children, but that we're established in the word of God. We're established in the, spirit of, in the things of the spirit of God. But this is where you, you learn the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, he just tells you to do that, and that's it. But praise God, praise God there's freedom in that. I'm not trying to compete with brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. But there's a walk, there's a walk in the spirit. And then finally, um, just got a final scripture I'm going to leave you with here. And that is, and this is something that I, I so love. This is Colossians 1, 9 through 11. The Apostle Paul says, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Now, when you hear that word walk, when you hear that word so, when you hear these spiritual action verbs, they're pointing you to door number two. And they're not undermining the work of grace. These are New Testament Bible words. We preach the word, and we preach the way the Bible reads. We walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, his spirit for all patience and long suffering with joy. A lot of times when you're over here and you're endeavoring to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, there are issues. There are love issues, people issues, you know, the flesh, the world, and the devil that try to get you knocked off your game, try to get you out of this place and get you back, go the other way. Don't go through these doors. Go back to, you know, we don't want to just, you know, celebrate who you are in Jesus and stay there. You know, you're not a threat to me there. So when you start walking in the spirit, then you're getting on my turf. You know, that's, that's when you start, you're, you're, you're using the weapons. Don't swing. The, you, you talk about the sword of the spirit, just don't swing it. All right? You can expound the glory of the shield of faith, just don't lift it up. Because you come over here, you lift it up. There's action, there's doing that's by design, that makes you strong in him. But I just want you to see it. I just want you to feel like you have permission to be disciplined. In the same way you would have a natural, physical permission to be disciplined, to bring your body under. You have permission to be disciplined in spiritual things, to get strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You to impose things and say, I'm doing this. I'm going after you, God. This is an expression of my love for him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. My obeying him, my following his words that he's commanded is an expression of my love for him. Door number two is an expression of my love for God. Door number one is, is an expression of his love for me. And I can go to heaven right here in door number one, okay? I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm not saved by grace through faith and walking in the spirit. I'm saved by grace through faith. That's it. There's nothing of me. Yeah, I'm here because I received God and I did this and this and this. There will be nothing you plus to the work of Christ that gets you into heaven. In fact, the apostle Paul, when he was writing, he said, if you got the foundation of Christ right, that's what you need. He said, there's people who are gonna build on this foundation, not things of the spirit. They're gonna build flesh stuff on that foundation. And everything they do in their life will be burned up, yet they'll still be saved. Yet so is by fire, they got the foundation right. But over here, when you do stuff over here, praise God, he rewards you according to these deeds that you've done in the body. He rewards, he's gonna, with the stuff you do over here, which is your expression of love for him, he's gonna someday thank you for the stuff that you do over here. But you're saved by grace through faith. It is an important distinction. Because sometimes, again, people can get over here and they can kind of get self-righteous and lose sight of that first door. And lose sight, it's, I'm only, the reason I'm over here is because grace. 
You've got to be disciplined in that grace. You don't just have to be disciplined in that grace for here to know who you are. You also got to be disciplined in that grace for here when you're tearing it up for the kingdom of God so you don't forget who you are. And you don't forget where you came from. That's why we have communion regularly to remind us of that first door. That's why we observe communion. We take the cup and the bread and say, wow, thank you, Jesus. The only reason I'm here doing what I'm doing is because of what you did for me through grace. So grace, the door of grace, the discipline of grace, and the spirit of God, the discipline of the spirit of God. We need them both. We're called to grow up. And that's what ministers are supposed to do. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. For the edifying of the body of Christ that we may grow up. Because when you come, if I just stay here and I really don't grow in, I can be tossed to and fro here. Because it's over here that I get rude. I don't just find out, hey, the love of God's been shed abroad in my heart. Well, that's good. It's good to know. It's a, it's a great speck. But it's when I get rooted and grounded in that love that I'm no longer tossed to and fro. So instead of saying, if you don't do this, God doesn't love you and you're not going to heaven. Yeah, you came along too late to tell me that. I know my God. I know his love. I'm rooted. I'm grounded. I'm not tossed by doctrines and wind like that. There's a grounding that happens over here. There's a maturing. He's coming back till we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow. There's a maturing work that requires discipline that doesn't undermine grace. Amen? Praise God. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for just the work that you're doing in our hearts. And I just thank you, Lord. Permission to be disciplined. Permission to listen to what your spirit is telling us to do. What's the spiritual regimen that you have for us? Lord, you're, you've been sent to lead and guide us into all truth. That includes that regimen. Help us, Lord, to just know that starting point. What is it, Lord, that just so witnesses with the spirit that's a starting point that we can begin that walk in the Spirit, that sowing to the Spirit, that endeavoring to be transformed. As we offer our bodies a living sacrifice, you, will, you don't offer our bodies a living sacrifice. We offer our bodies a living sacrifice. Even as you offer Jesus, we offer ourselves so that we may know that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Go ahead and make this... Go ahead and make this your declaration of faith if your heart can agree. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I am yours. I call you Lord because you saved me. I call you Lord because you've given me commands. And I do your commands because you're my Lord. You're the Lord of grace, the Lord of forgiveness, the Lord of mercy. And you're the Lord of the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's freedom. Freedom from ungodliness. Freedom from worldly lusts. Freedom from things that would distract me. From doing your will. I thank you, Jesus, for door number one. I am here because you first loved me. And I thank you, Jesus. You said, if I don't go, I won't send the Holy Spirit. But if I do go, I will send him. And he will be with you forever. I walk in that spirit. Show me, Lord. What's the regimen? I'm not afraid of discipline. I'm your disciple. I want to be strong in you. Not just my theology, but in the power of who you made me to be. The power of what you've put in me. Thank you for it, Father God. And I will follow you step by step with each step of this light yoke. I will walk free and I will reap of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, praise God. Receive that. You know, it's kind of a lot there. I know, kind of an age-old battle in some ways, but just trust in the Holy Spirit to show you and to realize how these two beautiful truths are just throughout the Word of God and how they wonderfully fit together. And there are times 
when I've just got to go, oh, Lord, thank you. I come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm not doing anything for God here. I'm here to receive mercy. I'm here to receive grace to help as I'm strong in the grace of God. There's times you don't leave this place. I don't want to imply that but you go from this place as you walk in the Spirit. But you're going to live in this place of grace. You're going to live, this was the first point, the discipline of being strong in grace, knowing who you are, knowing what God has done in you, living at that throne of grace where there's a flow of mercy and grace to help. Praise God. That's there. It's part of it. But then, I don't just live there. I'm walking in what God has called me to do by the Spirit of God. And when I do that, and I'm strong in the Lord into the power of His might. And those aren't just words. There's real, tangible, spiritual strength here that makes me free from the law of sin and death here. Praise God.